Millions of people are using cell phones today. In many places, it is actually considered unusual not to use one. In many countries, cell phones are very popular with young people. They find that the phones are more than a means of communication. Having a mobile phone shows that they are cool and connected. The explosion around the world in mobile phone use has some health professionals worried. Some doctors are concerned that in the future many people may suffer health problems from the use of mobile phones. In England, there has been a serious debate about this issue. Mobile phone companies are worried about the negative publicity of such ideas. They say that there is no proof that mobile phones are bad for your health. On the other hand, why do some medical studies show changes in the brain cells of some people who use mobile phones? Signs of change in the tissues of the brain and head can be detected with modern scanning equipment. In one case, a traveling salesman had to retire at a young age because of serious memory loss. He couldn't remember even simple tasks. He would often forget the name of his own son. This man used to talk on his mobile phone for about six hours a day, every day of his working week, for a couple of years. His family doctor blamed his mobile phone use, but his employer's doctor didn't agree. What is it that makes mobile phones potentially harmful? The answer is radiation. High-tech machines can detect very small amounts of radiation from mobile phones. Mobile phone companies agree that there is some radiation, but they say the amount is too small to worry about. As the discussion about their safety continues, it appears that it's best to use mobile phones less often. Use your regular phone if you want to talk for a long time. Use your mobile phone only when you really need it. Mobile phones can be very useful and convenient, especially in emergencies. In the future, mobile phones may have a warning label that says they are bad for your health. So for now, it's wise not to use your mobile phone too often. Just before midnight on December 12, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 fell out of the sky. The airplane crashed in the Everglades area of Florida. Of the 176 people on board, 99 died, including the airplane's pilot, Bob Loft, and the flight engineer, Don Repo. About three months after the crash, a high-ranking executive of Eastern Airlines boarded an aircraft for Miami, Florida. He spotted a man in a pilot's uniform sitting alone in the first-class section and went to sit down beside him. The executive struck up a conversation with the captain. After a few minutes, he realized that he was talking to the pilot, Bob Loft. Then the pilot faded away. A week later, an Eastern Airlines pilot and two of his crew went into a staff room at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. They all saw Bob Loft in a chair. He talked to them for a while, then vanished. The men were so shocked that the airline had to cancel their flight. Three weeks later, a passenger was sitting in the first-class section of a flight to Miami. She was worried about the man in an Eastern Airlines uniform sitting next to her. His face was white and he looked ill, so she called the flight attendant. The flight attendant leaned down to speak to the man, but he ignored her. Then, as she touched his arm, he slowly faded away, leaving only an empty seat. When the plane landed in Miami, the passenger was taken to a hospital in a state of shock. Later, when she saw photographs, she identified the ghost as flight engineer Don Repo. Over the next few months, more than ten flight attendants claimed to see Don Repo. 
the ghost seemed to appear more often on some aircraft than on others. Rumors began to spread that he appeared only on planes with replacement parts from the crashed Flight 401. It was usual practice for an airline to use undamaged parts from a crashed plane in another plane if they passed strict safety tests. The stories must have worried the bosses of Eastern Airlines. They ordered their engineers to remove from their planes all equipment from the 401 wreck. It seemed to work. When all the parts from Flight 401 had been removed, Bob Loft and Don Repo left Eastern Airlines and their aircraft in peace. No one has seen their ghosts since. Introduction Habitat for Humanity International, or Habitat, is a non-profit organization that helps people in need build houses. Since 1976, volunteers for Habitat have built more than 100,000 houses worldwide. According to Habitat, however, there are still more than 1.5 billion people in the world without decent housing. In the article below, Mariko Asano talks about her experience as a Habitat volunteer. She has traveled to the Philippines three times to help build houses for people who need them. I am 24 years old, and I grew up in Nishinomiya, Japan. Several years ago, I went to Negros Island in the Philippines as a Habitat volunteer. This was the first of three trips I have taken to the Philippines as a volunteer. For me, the idea of building somebody's house abroad was very exciting. The next year, I returned to Negros Island as a Habitat volunteer. This time, I went as a student leader with 28 classmates from Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. Both the staff and the families on Negros Island became dear friends of the work team I led. Meeting these people was wonderful for each of us. Their lifestyle reminded us of the meaning and value of life. The people also helped us appreciate the more valuable things in life, such as spending time with your family, friends, and neighbors, developing close relationships, helping each other, and appreciating what you do have. These things are sometimes forgotten in an affluent country like Japan. We thought we came to the Philippines to help the Filipino people, but they helped us to see something valuable. They generously offered their food, space, and hearts in a way we were not accustomed to. Would you give up your bed for a stranger and sleep on the cement floor at your own house? When I took my third trip to the Philippines, as a Habitat volunteer, I was assigned to a house with young people from around the world. In my group, there were Filipinos, Americans, Indians, Koreans, and Japanese. We worked together to complete a house for a family we met on the site. On the last day, all of us stood inside a room we had built in just a week, feeling a sense of fulfillment. Even now, we keep in touch across the world. Some of us are actively involved in Habitat in different countries. Habitat brings people together and helps us realize that people all over the world care about each other. Habitat sends the very important message that we can all be friends. Being involved with Habitat for Humanity has changed my life. I've learned that I can make a difference in the world. Baseball is a very popular sport in Asia, North America, South America, and even Europe. While the rules of baseball are similar from country to country, the behavior of baseball fans is very different. Here's a look at some of the differences in fan behavior around the world. In Japan Baseball fans in Japan are loud, really loud. The sound of chants, cheering, drums, and trumpets continues nonstop 
throughout a baseball game in Japan. When a team goes to bat, their fans sing a different song for each batter at the plate. And even when their team is losing badly, Japanese fans continue to yell and scream. Foreign baseball players in Japan are often surprised that the fans never boo a player. According to the American pitcher Brian Warren, baseball is more fun in Japan. When I used to play in Venezuela, Warren said, fans threw things at me when I didn't pitch well. This never happens in Japan. When a Japanese player hits a home run, the fans give the biggest cheer of all a bonsai cheer. That's when the fans yell with both of their arms above their heads. In Taiwan, baseball fans in Taiwan are just as loud as the fans in Japan. In Taiwan, many fans use air horns to cheer their team on. These horns are so loud they can really hurt your ears. Taiwanese fans often yell, Charge! to excite the baseball players. And when a player hits a home run, there is a special tradition. After the player runs around the bases, a young girl presents him with a stuffed animal that looks like his team's mascot. In the United States, Asian visitors to the United States are often surprised and disappointed by how quiet American baseball fans are. When I went to a baseball game in San Francisco, everybody was just sitting there watching the game. It was kind of boring, says Barry Lin, a Taiwanese student at the University of California, Berkeley. Baseball was invented in the United States, Lin says. But Americans don't seem very excited about their game. It's true. Baseball fans in the United States are some of the quietest in the world. It's common to see baseball fans eating hot dogs and popcorn and chatting with friends. When I go to a baseball game, says Ginger Hansen from San Francisco, I want to have fun with friends and catch up on their lives. The real reason I go is for the social experience. In the Dominican Republic, like the fans in Japan and Taiwan, the fans in the Dominican Republic cheer loudly throughout the game. They also sing and dance. Since music and dancing are an important part of Dominican culture, You might even find a merengue band moving through the stands at a baseball game. Despite the music and dancing, many Dominican fans are very serious about baseball. Carol Parmenter, an American living in the Dominican Republic, says At Dominican games, you see groups of men drinking small cups of sweet coffee, carefully analyzing every pitch, every hit, every play. American fans don't usually follow the game that closely. Vanessa May was born in Singapore in 1977. Her mother was Chinese and her father was from Thailand. At the age of four, Vanessa May moved to London, England with her mother and stepfather. As a young child, Vanessa May was already a talented musician. She took her first piano lesson when she was three years old and her first violin lesson when she was five. Developing Skills Vanessa May studied music at the Central Conservatory of China in Beijing. She was the youngest student the conservatory had ever accepted. She also took lessons at the famous Royal College of Music in London. The director of the college described Vanessa May as a true child prodigy, like Mozart and Mendelssohn. When Vanessa May was just eight years old, she had to make a big decision. She was equally gifted at both the violin and the piano, but she had to concentrate on just one instrument. Although she had just won a prize at a famous piano competition, Vanessa May chose the violin. 
At the age of nine, Vanessa May went to Germany to take violin classes for advanced students. The best students were usually chosen to be a part of the recitals just once or twice. Vanessa May was chosen four times. These were her first performances in front of an audience. By the time she was ten years old, Vanessa May had studied the violin at some of the best schools in the world. She made her first professional appearance in 1987 with the Philharmonic Orchestra in London. Vanessa May often played Mozart concertos. A concerto is a piece of music written for one or more solo instruments accompanied by an orchestra. Accomplishments. By the time she was twelve, Vanessa May had played with orchestras all over the world as a soloist. She had also released three classical recordings. Although she loved classical music, Vanessa May wanted to experiment with other kinds of music. At fourteen, she began to combine the traditional sound of her acoustic violin with the sounds made from her new electric violin. She called this music techno-acoustic fusion. Vanessa May loved the music that the two types of violins made together. Her first album with techno-acoustic fusion music was called The Violin Player. It was an instant success and sold in over twenty countries. It was even a hit on the best-selling music charts. No longer just a classical musician, Vanessa May was asked to perform at international rock concerts. At a concert in Switzerland, the audience of fifty thousand people gave her a twenty-minute ovation. The crowd did not want her to stop playing. Vanessa May has sometimes been criticized for not just playing classical music. However, she feels it is important to introduce violin music to a new audience. If, as a result of my music, people see the violin as a fresh, up-to-date instrument, that's fine with me. What happens if you don't get enough sleep? Randy Gardner, a high school student in the United States, wanted to find out. He designed an experiment on the effects of sleeplessness for a school science project. With doctors watching him carefully, Gardner stayed awake for 264 hours and 12 minutes. That's 11 days and nights without sleep. What effect did sleeplessness have on Gardner? After 24 hours without sleep, Gardner started having trouble reading and watching television. The words and pictures were too blurry. By the third day, he was having trouble doing things with his hands. By the fourth day, Gardner was hallucinating. For example, when he saw a street sign, he thought it was a person. He also imagined he was a famous football player. Over the next few days, Gardner's speech became so slurred that people couldn't understand him. He also had trouble remembering things. By the eleventh day, Gardner couldn't pass a counting test. In the middle of the test, he simply stopped counting. He couldn't remember what he was doing. When Gardner finally went to bed, he slept for fourteen hours and forty-five minutes. The second night, he slept for twelve hours. The third night, he slept for ten and one half hours, and by the fourth night, he had returned to his normal sleep schedule. Even though Gardner recovered quickly, scientists believe that going without sleep can be dangerous. They say that people should not repeat Randy's experiment. Tests on white rats have shown how serious sleeplessness can be. After a few weeks without sleep, the rats started losing their fur, 
and even though the rats ate more food than usual, they lost weight. Eventually, the rats died. During your lifetime, you will probably spend 25 years or more sleeping. But why? What is the purpose of sleep? Surprisingly, scientists don't know for sure. Some scientists think we sleep in order to replenish brain cells. Other scientists think that sleep helps the body to grow and to relieve stress. Whatever the reason, we know that it is important to get enough sleep. Mika Tanaka, a college student from Japan, had a wonderful homestay in London. She lived with a British family and studied English for a month. What do you want for your 19th birthday? My parents asked me. A ring, I replied. However, instead of a ring, my parents gave me a one-month homestay in London. On February 11th, I left Japan. On the plane, I worried about being all alone there, a stranger to London. But when I met the Flannery family, my host family, their warm welcome made me feel at ease. Both my host father and mother were very kind and treated me like their own daughter. Getting ready to go. Before going to London, I did some research on English schools in London and chose Oxford House College, mainly because it had reasonable fees. Also, there weren't many Japanese students at Oxford House. I took my parents' advice and requested that my homestay family have both a mother and a father, be native-born, non-smoking, middle-class British people, and live near a subway station. I later found that this was very good advice, since some of my friends at the English school were having problems with their host families. Living in London Potatoes It took me a little time to get used to the many kinds of potato dishes served. Fried potatoes, steamed potatoes, sliced potatoes, and different colored potatoes. My host mother was a good cook. She made delicious pasta and chicken dishes and even cooked rice for me. Nadege, a French girl, was another homestay student living with us, and we went around London together. On Saturdays, my host family would have a party at home with friends or family. When we returned from touring London, Nadege and I would join the party. On Saturday evenings, Mr. and Mrs. Flannery would go to their favorite pub to spend time together. Although I selected a school with few Japanese students, there were still at least two in each class. In class, I tried to speak a lot, but many Japanese students didn't use their English very much, even if they had large vocabularies and spoke only Japanese with their friends. Sometimes I asked other people their impressions of Japan. Japanese people work too hard, said my French friend. My teacher thought that Japanese people were very rich. I did not agree with these points, but I was interested in knowing what foreign people thought. One month in London made me realize that speaking English was very important, because it is the language that people from many countries use the most. I would like to be more open-minded about people from different countries, like my host family is. Will people still read books a hundred years from now? A few years ago, many people would have said no. It seemed likely that computers and the Internet would replace books. Now, however, most experts think that books are here to stay. There are a number of reasons why computers won't replace books entirely. 
One reason is that books on paper are much cheaper than computers. Books don't need a power source either. You can read a book for as long as you want and wherever you want. You never have to worry about losing power. Also, many people feel more comfortable reading words in a book than reading words on a computer screen. It's less tiring to the eyes. Will books in the future be similar to the books you can buy today? The answer to that question is no. In the future, you may only need to buy one book. With this one book, you will be able to read novels, plays, and even today's newspaper. It will look like today's book, but it will be electronic. One of the people working on the book of the future is Professor Joseph Jacobson from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the U.S. Professor Jacobson's book will have a small button on the side. When you press the button, words will instantly appear on the page. When you want to read a different story, you can push the button again and a new story will quickly appear. What is the technology behind Professor Jacobson's book? Two important inventions will make this new kind of book possible. Electronic ink and radio paper. Electronic ink, or e-ink, is a liquid that can be printed on paper, metal, or anything else. E-ink looks and feels like printed words on paper. Unlike regular ink, however, words in e-ink are not permanent. They can be changed by pushing a button. When you push the button, all of the words on the page go away and new words appear. The other new development is radio paper. This paper looks and feels like a page in a book. In reality, however, radio paper is made of plastic. Professor Jacobson calls his book of the future the last book. This book, he says, will be the last book you will ever need. Have you ever wondered why some people are successful in business and others are not? Here's a story about one successful business person. He started out washing dishes, and today he owns 168 restaurants. Zubair Kazi was born in Batkal, a small town in southwest India. His dream was to be an airplane pilot, and when he was 16 years old, he learned to fly a small plane. At the age of 23, and with just a little money in his pocket, Mr. Kazi moved to the United States. He hoped to get a job in the airplane industry in California. Instead, he ended up working for a company that rented cars. While Mr. Kazi was working at the car rental company, he frequently ate at a nearby KFC restaurant. To save money on food, he decided to get a job with KFC. For two months, he worked as a cook's assistant. His job was to clean the kitchen and help the cook. I didn't like it, Mr. Kazi says but I always did the best I could. One day, Mr. Kazi's two co-workers failed to come to work. That day, Mr. Kazi did the work of all three people in the kitchen. This really impressed the owners of the restaurant. A few months later, the owners needed a manager for a new restaurant. They gave the job to Mr. Kazi. He worked hard as the manager and soon the restaurant was making a profit. A few years later, Mr. Kazi heard about a restaurant that was losing money. The restaurant was dirty inside, and the food was terrible, greasy and undercooked. Mr. Kazi borrowed money from a bank and bought the restaurant. For the first six months, Mr. Kazi worked in the restaurant from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week. He and his wife cleaned up the restaurant, remodeled the front of the building, and improved the cooking. They also tried hard to please the customers. If someone had to wait more than 10 minutes for their food, 
Mrs. Kazi gave them a free soda. Before long, the restaurant was making a profit. A year later, Mr. Kazi sold his restaurant for a profit. With the money he earned, he bought three more restaurants that were losing money. Again, he cleaned them up, improved the food, and retrained the employees. Before long, these restaurants were making a profit too. Today, Mr. Kazi owns 168 restaurants, but he isn't planning to stop there. He's looking for more poorly managed restaurants to buy. I love it when I go to buy a restaurant and find it's a mess, Mr. Kazi says. The only way it can go is up. Tetsuya Saruhashi grew up in Tokyo, Japan. He worked and studied for a year in Toronto, Canada. This story is based on two of Tetsuya's experiences there. How well do you speak English? Could you survive in an English speaking country? Last year, I went to live and study in Canada. Before going, I took several English conversation classes. I also listened to a lot of English conversation tapes, and I practiced speaking English with some foreign friends in my country. But could I communicate with people in Canada? During my first months in Canada, I didn't have a lot of trouble understanding people. This was a happy surprise. Unfortunately, however, Canadians couldn't always understand me. This was because of my pronunciation. My biggest pronunciation problems were with the V sound and the L sound. For example, when I said the word vote, it sounded like boat. And when I said the word late, it sounded like rate. One day, I decided to look for some volunteer work. I went to the tourist center in Toronto to ask for information about volunteering. Can I help you? The woman at the tourist center asked. Yes, I'm looking for some volunteer work, I replied. Unfortunately, I pronounced the word volunteer like volunteer. I'm sorry, she said. What are you looking for? Volunteer work, I answered, saying volunteer again. She looked at me strangely. And then she called to a man behind the counter. Can I help you? The man asked. Yes, I'm looking for some volunteer work, I repeated. Could you write that for me? He asked. I wrote the words down and he immediately understood me. After that, I spent a lot of time practicing the V sound and the L sound. I had trouble pronouncing a few other English sounds too. I remember a funny experience I had at a nightclub. I wanted to get something to drink, so I went up to the bartender. Excuse me, tonic water, please, I said. What? the bartender asked. I asked, Can I have a tonic water? Say it again, he responded. I was kind of disappointed that he couldn't understand me. I repeated my request several times, but still he couldn't understand me. Then, suddenly, he opened the cash register and took out some quarters. He put the quarters on the bar and began to count them. At first, I didn't know what he was doing. Then, suddenly, I understood. I asked for tonic water, but he thought I asked for twenty quarters. I burst into laughter and said, No, I didn't ask for twenty quarters. I just want tonic water. The bartender seemed embarrassed. I'm so sorry, he said to me. The music is so loud. Now, whenever I ask for tonic water, I remember this incident and I look forward to the bartender's response.
It was love at first sight. It's always exciting to hear those words. But do people really believe in love at first sight? We asked 40 Americans this question, 18 men and 22 women. 13 people, 32%, said they believed in love at first sight. 27 people, 68%, said they didn't. Next, we wanted to find out who believed in love at first sight and who didn't. We were surprised to find that both younger and older people believed they could fall in love in a few short seconds. We also learned that people from many different professions had love at first sight experiences. These people included a scientist, an artist, a dancer, and a computer programmer. What was the most interesting thing we learned in our study? More men believed in love at first sight than women. 44% of the men believed in this kind of love, while only 27% of the women did. Here's what some of the men and women in our survey said about love at first sight. Name, John. Occupation, artist. Age, 30. Yes, I believe in love at first sight. It happened to me. I was at a party several years ago when I saw Louisa. I knew she was the one for me when her eyes flashed back at me. It was like they looked into my heart, read my life story, and said, I like what I see and want to be with you. That night at the party, I went over to Louisa and asked her to dance. She said, Of course. I was waiting for you to ask. That was three years ago, and we're still together. Name, Mark. Occupation, Salesman. Age, 35. I didn't used to believe in love at first sight, but now I do. About four years ago, I was giving a sales presentation when this amazing woman walked into the room. We made eye contact, and my heart started beating faster. After my presentation, I introduced myself, and she and I went out for dinner the next night. We talked and talked, and by the end of the evening, I was truly in love with her. That feeling of love at first sight was like nothing else. In just a few seconds, I was filled with intense energy and passion. Anne and I got married a year later. Name, Emily. Occupation, college student. Age, 23. No, I don't believe in love at first sight. Love comes later in a relationship. When I met my boyfriend, I felt something tingly. I guess you could call it puppy love, but it wasn't true love. It took about a year for true love to develop between us. Name, Carol. Occupation, writer. Age, 37. Do I believe in love at first sight? No, not really. Love is based on trust and shared experiences and values. Love takes time to develop. You fall in love slowly by talking to a special person, writing him love letters, fighting, making up. The key to love is staying excited about the other person month after month, year after year. Name, Sarah. Occupation, high school senior. Age, 18. I don't think love at first sight happens very often, but of course it happens sometimes. It makes me happy to think that it might happen to me. If I didn't believe love at first sight was possible, it would be really depressing. 
Each month, National Geographic magazine asks an editor from one of its international editions to answer the question, what are the best places to visit in your area of the world? Yong Shu Li, the editor of National Geographic Taiwan, thinks the sites below are some of the best places to visit in Taiwan. Would you like to visit these places? Xu Lin Night Market. This market is the center of Taiwanese nightlife on the north side of Taipei. It's very different from the morning markets where people shop for food to cook at home. At the Xu Lin Night Market, people show up to have a snack or drink, buy a few things, and just hang around. Life really begins around 6 p.m. and can go on until 3 in the morning. On weekends, the market is open even later. Toroko Gorge. The word Toroko means beautiful in the language of the Atayal people, and that's exactly what the Toroko Gorge is. Visitors can take a train or a 30-minute flight from Taipei to visit this natural wonder. A 12-mile, 19-kilometer bus tour takes passengers through the gorge making stops for riders to walk through man-made tunnels or enjoy the scenic views. Lanyu, Orchid Island. This small island about 40 miles, 60 kilometers, southeast of Taiwan is home to the native Yame people. It is one of the few places in Taiwan where the traditions of native people are still well preserved. Tourists can stay in island hotels or arrange to stay in a Yame family's home. Lanyu is also home to many species found nowhere else in the world. Its beautiful coral reefs are also great for scuba diving. The National Palace Museum When the Chinese nationalists lost the Civil War in the late 1940s, they went to Taiwan taking the imperial treasures with them. These treasures are now housed at the National Palace Museum in Taipei. It's the best collection of Chinese artifacts in the world. So, if visitors want to know more about the cultural heritage of China, this is the place to go. However, it takes a few days to see the museum at a leisurely pace. Chung Jae-hyuk wrote this story when he was a university student in Seoul, Korea. Approximately 10.3 million people live in and around Seoul. Wednesday, 7 a.m. I get up about 7 o'clock in the morning. Since my friends and I have a group blind date with students from a women's university tonight, I take extra time to look my best. My mom calls me to eat breakfast, but I don't think I can. It's already 7.30, and I don't want to be late for my 9 o'clock class. It takes me about an hour and a half to get to my university, so I hurry out. 8 to 9 a.m. I take the bus to the subway station. There are so many people in the bus that I can't breathe. There is so much traffic that the bus can only crawl along. Finally, the bus arrives at the subway station. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people on the train, and the air is stuffy. We finally arrive at Chinshan Station, and my university is now about a ten-minute walk away. I run to my philosophy class so I won't be late again. I have already missed this class four times. 9 to 11 a.m. Thank goodness I'm safe. The professor comes in just after me. But now I'm so tired from running that I can't concentrate. Then the person next to me asks what the homework is for our English class. That's right, there was English homework, but I forgot to do it. So I spend philosophy class doing my English homework. English class is next. 
It seems like English is one big mountain that we all have to get over in our university days. If we want to get a decent job, we have to be really good in English. 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. After two classes, it's now 11 o'clock, and I decide to go to my club room. Our club members spend their free time hanging out in that room. I chit chat with my friends for a while, and then go to one of our school cafeterias for lunch. 2 to 5:30 p.m. Now it's 2 o'clock, and I have one more class at 3 o'clock. My friends and I decide not to go to our three o'clock class. I shouldn't do this, but we don't want to hurry to the women's university after class. Instead, we go to play some billiards until it's time to go. Five thirty to ten thirty p.m. It's five thirty in a coffee shop in front of the university. All four of us are excited and wondering what the girls will be like. About ten minutes later, four girls come in. Then the awkward time begins. We ask some questions, and so do they. I find my dream girl sitting in the corner, but I don't have the guts to speak to her. After twenty minutes, it's time to choose our partners. We decide, at the count of three, to point at the partner we would like to have. If a boy and a girl are pointing at each other, they become partners. One, two, three. My dream girl is also pointing at me. I spend the evening with my partner, having a wonderful time. Right before we part, I ask for her phone number. If she gives me her number, that means she also likes me. And she does. I get home about ten thirty. I'm very tired, but really happy, hoping that things go well with her. On September thirtieth, nineteen ninety nine, there was an accident at a nuclear power plant in Tokaimura, Japan. On that day, three plant employees accidentally poured too much uranium into a tank, which led to a leak of radiation. At least ninety people were exposed to high radiation. One worker died. Other countries have had similar accidents. There was a close call at a nuclear plant at Three Mile Island in the United States. On March twenty-eighth, nineteen seventy-nine, there was a reactor meltdown at this plant. A reactor meltdown happens when the fuel inside a reactor melts. Unless immediate safety measures are taken, a meltdown can lead to radiation leaking into the atmosphere. Probably the most famous nuclear accident occurred at a plant in Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union. The accident happened on April twenty-six, nineteen eighty-six, when things went terribly wrong during an experiment. This caused a meltdown so serious. That the top of a reactor exploded into the sky. Radiation leaked into the atmosphere for more than a week. Wind carried some of the radioactive pollution over large parts of Europe. Many deaths and birth defects throughout Europe have resulted from this horrible event. The idea of using nuclear power as a form of energy grew out of weapons research before and during World War II. 1939 to 1945. Nuclear power was first used to make electricity on December 20th, 1951. By the 1960s, nuclear energy was becoming cheap to produce, and utility companies were building plenty of plants. However, in the 1970s, there were concerns about the possibilities of nuclear disasters and environmental problems. Then those concerns came true with the tragedy at Chernobyl and the near disaster at Three Mile Island. Today, supporters of nuclear energy say it is a necessary source of power. 
This is especially true in countries like Japan, which depends on nuclear energy for about 35% of its power. Obviously, taking away that source of energy could badly hurt the economy. Also, while minor accidents sometimes happen at nuclear plants, most are contained without deaths or serious injuries. For now, nuclear energy is probably not going away. Citizens should demand that government agencies have very strict safety measures for nuclear power plants. At the same time, we must find other safer and cheaper sources of energy. What's in a cigarette? What's in a puff? Tobacco smoke contains about 4,000 chemicals, some of which are harmful, others deadly. Here are three of the deadliest. Tar. Tar, a mixture of chemicals such as formaldehyde, arsenic and cyanide, can cause serious lung diseases. 70% of the tar from tobacco smoke remains in the smoker's lungs. Nicotine. Many people are unaware that nicotine is more addictive than heroin. A powerful and fast-acting drug, nicotine reaches the brain in about seven seconds. One of the major effects of nicotine is an increased heart rate and blood pressure. Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a poisonous gas formed when a cigarette is lit. The red blood cells absorb the gas more easily than oxygen, so up to 15% of a smoker's blood may be carrying carbon monoxide instead of oxygen. Breathing becomes more difficult because the heart has to work harder to pump less oxygen around the body. From seed to smoke. What do tomatoes and tobacco have in common? They are both a member of the same botanical family. Tobacco is grown in more than 100 countries, with China being the largest producer, closely followed by the USA. Tobacco can grow well in poorer soils, so a typical farmer can expect a good income from planting this crop. Seeds and fertilizer are often provided by British American tobacco. The seeds are so small that they must be protected in seed beds for 60 days before transplanting to the field. Two weeks later, soil is carefully pushed up against the seedlings to further protect them and help to develop a good root system. Finally, after a couple of months, the flowering plants and some of the upper leaves are cut to allow more growth in the remaining leaves. The crop gradually grows towards the harvesting stage. Harvest. In most countries, harvesting is done by hand. The farmer takes off a few leaves from the lower part of each plant. A typical farmer can expect to harvest about 15,000 plants. This is quite a lot, considering each plant contains around 22 leaves. Curing. There are four main methods. Air-cured tobacco is hung in unheated, ventilated barns until the tobacco dries and the tobacco leaf becomes a light to medium brown colour. Flue-cured tobacco is made when heat is introduced into a barn through pipes from a furnace outside. The leaves are heated until they turn yellow. Sun-cured tobacco leaves are hung out on racks and exposed to the sun's rays. The direct heat turns the leaves a yellow to orange colour. For fire curing, wood is burnt under the tobacco leaves, which dries the tobacco and produces a smoky fragrance. Processing. There are four stages in processing. Dirt is removed from the cured tobacco. The leaf is separated from the stem, a process known as threshing. The moisture content is checked carefully. The processed tobacco is packed into 200 kilogram cardboard boxes for shipping to manufacturing sites. Manufacturing. At the factory, the matured tobacco is checked for quality 
and then carefully blended with other ingredients which are needed for the brand recipe, such as flavorings. Moisture content is crucial. Too dry, and the tobacco leaf will crumble. Too moist, and it may spoil during storage. The blended tobacco is treated with just the right amount of steam and water to make it supple. And then cut into the form in which it appears in the cigarette. The cut tobacco is then given a quality check. Cigarette making, once done entirely by hand, is today almost fully automated with the cut tobacco, cigarette paper, and filters continuously fed into the cigarette making machines. Packing machines put the cigarettes into the familiar brand packs. Wrap the packs in protective film, and group them into cartons and cases. The completed cases, time dated to ensure the freshest product possible, are then ready for distribution. As I write this, I have half an eye on an old James Bond film that is showing on my computer. But this is a story about how I stopped watching TV. And began reading again for pleasure, after ten years in which I hardly turned a page. I suppose I was an avid reader of literature between the ages of nine and fourteen. I had enough time to be White Fang, Robinson Crusoe, and Bilbo Baggins and Jeeves. Of course, there was room in the schoolboy's imagination for some real historical figures, Scott of the Antarctic. All of the Vikings and Benjamin Franklin were good friends of mine. Then, in adolescence, I began a long search for strange and radical ideas. I wanted to challenge my elders and betters and stir up my peers with amazing points of view. Of course, the only place to look was in books. I hunted out the longest titles and the authors with the funniest names. I scoured the library for completely unread books. Then I found one which became my bible for the whole of 1982. It had a title composed of eleven long words, and an author whose name I didn't know how to pronounce. It was really thick and looked dead serious. Even better, it put forward a whole worldview that would take days to explain. Perfect. I took it out of the library three times. Proud to see the date stamps lined up on the empty library insert. Later, I went to university, expecting to spend long evenings in learned discussion with clever people. I started reading philosophy. For some reason, I never found the deep-thinking intellectuals I hoped to meet. Anyway, I was ready to impress with my profound knowledge of post-structuralism, existentialism, and situationism. These things are usually explained in rather short books, but they take a long time to get through. They were the end of my youthful reading. Working life was hard to get used to after so much theory. It was the end of books for me. There didn't seem to be much in books that would actually get things done. To do things, you had to answer the telephone and work a computer. You had to travel about and speak to people who weren't at all interested in philosophy. I didn't stop reading; you can't avoid that. I read all day, but no books came my way. Only manuals and pamphlets and contracts and documents. Maybe most people satisfy their need for stories and ideas with TV, and to tell the truth, it was all I needed for ten years. In those days. I only had a book on the go for the duration of aeroplane flights. At first, I would come home and watch TV over dinner. Then I moved the TV so I could watch it from bed. I even rigged up a switch so I could turn it off without getting out of bed. Then one fateful day, my TV broke and my landlady took it away. My new TV is an extra circuit board inside my computer. It's on a desk in front of a working chair, and I can't see it from the bed. I still use it for the weather forecasts, and it's nice to have it on while I'm typing this. But what to do last thing at night? Well, have another go with books. Now I just like books.
I have a pile of nice ones by my bed, and I'm reading about six simultaneously. I don't want to be any of the characters. I don't care if a thousand people have already read them. I don't have to search through libraries. There are books everywhere, and all of them have something to read in them. I have a strange feeling that they've been there all along, waiting for me to pick them up. When Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in 1876, it was a revolution in communication. For the first time, people could talk to each other over great distances almost as clearly as if they were in the same room. Nowadays, though, we increasingly use Bell's invention for taking photographs, accessing the internet, or watching video clips, rather than talking. Over the last two decades, a new means of spoken communication has emerged, the mobile phone. The modern mobile phone is a more complex version of the two-way radio. Traditional two-way radio was a very limited means of communication. As soon as the users moved out of range of each other's broadcast area, the signal was lost. In the 1940s, researchers began experimenting with the idea of using a number of radio masts located around the countryside to pick up signals from two-way radios. A caller would always be within range of one of the masts. When he moved too far away from one mast, the next mast would pick up the signal. Scientists referred to each mast's reception area as being a separate cell. This is why in many countries mobile phones are called cell phones. However, 1940s technology was still quite primitive, and the telephones were enormous boxes which had to be transported by car. The first real mobile telephone call was made in 1973 by Dr. Martin Cooper, the scientist who invented the modern mobile handset. As soon as his invention was complete, he tested it by calling a rival scientist to announce his success. Within a decade, mobile phones became available to the public. The streets of modern cities began to feature sharp-suited characters shouting into giant plastic bricks. In Britain, the mobile phone quickly became synonymous with the yuppie, the new breed of young urban professionals who carried the expensive handsets as status symbols. Around this time, many of us swore that we would never, ever own a mobile phone. But in the mid-90s, something happened. Cheaper handsets and cheaper calling rates meant that almost overnight it seemed that everyone had a mobile phone. And the giant plastic bricks of the 80s had evolved into smooth little objects that fitted nicely into pockets and bags. In every pub and restaurant, you could hear the bleep and buzz of mobiles ringing and registering messages, occasionally breaking out into primitive versions of the latest pop songs. Cities suddenly had a new postmodern bird song. Moreover, people's timekeeping changed. Younger readers will be amazed to know that not long ago, people made spoken arrangements to meet at a certain place at a certain time. Once a time and place had been agreed, people met as agreed. Somewhere around the new millennium, this practice started to die out. Meeting times became approximate, subject to change at any moment under the new order of communication, the short message service, SMS, or text message. Going to be late? Send a text message. It takes much less effort than arriving on time, and it's much less awkward than explaining your lateness face to face. It's the perfect communication method for the busy modern lifestyle. Like email before it, the text message has altered the way we write in English, bringing more abbreviations and a more lax approach to language construction. The 160 character limit on text messages has led to a new abbreviated version of English for fast and instantaneous communication. Traditional rules of grammar and spelling are much less important when you're sitting on the bus hurriedly typing will be 15 min late see you at the bar sorry exclamation mark smiley face. 
Mobile phones, once the preserve of the high-powered business person and the yuppie, are now a vital part of daily life for an enormous amount of people. From school children to pensioners, every section of society has found that it's easier to stay in touch when you've got a mobile. Over the last few years, mobiles have become more and more advanced. Firstly, we saw the introduction of built-in cameras, global positioning devices and internet access. More recently, we have witnessed the arrival of the third generation of mobile phones. Powerful microcomputers with broadband internet access, which will allow us to watch TV, download internet files at high speed and send instant video clips to friends. Alexander Graham Bell would be amazed if he could see how far the science of telephony has progressed in less than 150 years. If he were around today, he might say, That's great, but I'm v-busy right now. We'll call you tonight.